for your civil rights out on the cruel streets tonight for Sylvia and Marcia life was harder than you ever know a silly place to start where others just threw a stone Today, our very good friend from Dublin City Council, uh, Martina Malone. So, Martina, welcome back to Dublin City FM and uh, welcome back to uh, LGBTQ Plus Life. Thanks, Nick. It's uh, always lovely to be here. Yeah. I mean, th the last time we spoke, it was also on Zoom. Um, how, were you mm. find, how did you find the, um, the pandemic? Do you think it was a there were positives out of it in that sense, particularly in, in terms of uh, the way we work together and even how we communicate together. I, th I think there's, yeah, I do actually, I think there's been huge positives. It's like anything else. It took me a little while to get into my groove with working remotely. Um, but when I did, I find I enjoy it much better. Now, having said that, I, I think we should always be very conscious as LGBT people about not using our spaces and about not using our, uh, real life communication with one another, Zooms and all uh, teams and whatever other communication tools we're using uh, while we were in lockdown. Obviously, mm -hmm. we're very good to keep in touch. However, I th still think it's, we need to keep an eye on maintaining our spaces because that's what we build our community on and that's that's hugely important. Yeah. Um, and I found too, when we were going back into the workplace on a phased basis, which we're still doing on a phased basis, Going in when other LGBT people weren't around wasn't always that easy, you know. So uh, pluses and minuses, obviously. Yeah. Sure. And <clears throat> I mean, one of the big casualties have been obviously the prides. Now I know that there was a pride yeah. in there. Uh, there was one in there, uh, uh, Tremor, and there was another one. Cork had one, but they were quite restricted the way Dublin's tended to be very much uh, virtual for the last couple of years. Yeah. I suspect, like myself, you're really looking forward to uh, getting out there and marching again and just meeting up with the people who we've had not had much chance to meet in the last couple of years. Oh, I think it's, yeah, I'm, I can't wait. I mean, there's a virtual pride that we had in Dublin last year and the year before. It was very good. It was good to maintain that contact. Mm -hmm. But I think... Uh, and it was a pleasant surprise it went off so well. I mean, I don't think people really, so you give hats off to Dublin Pride there, but uh, there's nothing like the real thing. It's really Absolutely. nothing like the real thing. And it reaffirms our, uh, us as A, a community, and a B, a community, uh, particularly if you're my age or, and older, that has come from, our pride has come from our need to fight for and make a statement and march for our rights and our rights as, as being gays, bi's and trans people. So we need to, still to be seen and I'd like to keep that link with the, the fight for our rights and our history with the current day prides, you know. Sure. <clears throat> I mean, one of the very positives I'm finding, particularly for this program, is it's given me an opportunity to go out there and connect with what I would call decentralized areas. So I've spoken to people, I've had prides, I've spoken to people about prides in Waterford, Drogheda, Dundalk, Galway, Mayo, Cork, Tremor, all these places out there. How important do you think it is, is that we suddenly, we have been, let's be honest, the, uh, a bit Dublin centric. Uh, I know this uh, program has. How important do you think it is, is that we start joining all those dots because there's fabulous energy out there? Um, I think we should. I, I, I think it's time that we, it has been Dublin centric, right? And we trying to forget because we're we're a minority we have a minor, we're a minority that has one thing in common we have a very serious thing in common and that is we have all had to come out at some stage in our lives mm -hmm. whether it's to ourselves to our families to our work whether you know as lgbt people at some stage we've been closeted mm -hmm. uh, and more that we have fought for our rights and have acquired our rights and with marriage equality and uh, the improvements for trans people legally uh, we need to go back a, a deeper into our communities I think to, because there are people there who are always going to fall off the edge or are not going to be included uh, and there's great diversity out there 
uh, and that diversity can only enhance and enrich our experiences. So the further into and more deeper into our communities we go, the better I think it will be. Mm -hmm. We can't but enhance our, our, our experiences of ourselves. Yeah, you know? uh, and it's something I've spoken to you about several times in the past is um, LGBT staff rep associations, particularly in local government. Now, you were very um, central to establishing one in Dublin, and you were very much a mentor to the people out there in South Dublin Council. It doesn't seem yeah. to have made the progress that I personally would have liked to see. Uh, is there any more you could tell us about that, or are they still the two only staff, uh, LGBT staff uh, uh, representative bodies in the country? In in local authorities, yes. In local authorities, yes. Yeah. In local authorities, yeah. We were we the city council, as you know, set up its network because there was it just in our workforce, and it is still a problem. And it's a problem that we, as a network, are still discussing. That more and more, there is about I think about a third of people, and I would suspect that figure is a little higher, mm -hmm. uh, of P, of LGBT people in the workplace are not out at work, or they're not out to a line manager, or they're not out to most people in work, and. Sure. What they don't want to come out and work, they're not comfortable coming out and work, and I'm specifically talking about local government now, that because there is a fear that they will uh, damage their careers. Now you have to remember, mm -hmm. local government has provides diverse services, so mm -hmm. you'll have something like the fire brigade, an ambulance service, uh, to a park service, to the professional side of things like architects and all that kind of stuff. So there's there's a, a variety of um, mm -hmm. levels of uh, professionalism and skills and trades and all the rest of it, and some of the those sections within local government have a have a traditionally uh, macho um, culture, mm -hmm. and yeah. I'm, I'm I'm specifically talking about the fire brigade, and they don't uh, just have. And I don't want, I'm not being negative in relation to Dublin Fire Brigade because they are doing excellent work in this regard, mm -hmm. but just to just to put it in context for you, apart from uh, the fact that a fire brigade service has traditionally not just in dublin city but around the country has a traditional um macho culture and they have had challenges in not only recruiting uh open lgbt people they've had they've had difficulty recruiting women yeah. uh, and certainly in dublin city council there is a focus on that at the moment mm -hmm. however when when what happens is because of the structure of the local authority and certainly the structure of the local authority in dublin city uh, south dublin uh, is the same uh, or any of the local authorities is the same. This is a hierarchical structure and people are given specific roles. So there will be somebody with a responsibility in a HR department that has responsibility for equality and inclusion. And that becomes their, their role. And they're associated then with, oh, we must speak to the equality officer or the equality office or to HR about what we can do for LGBT people or for what we can do for women in the fire brigade or what we can do for whatever it is. And and while that might have its place, it can become exclusive. And the people who are directly affected, in other words, the people employed within the city council or the local authorities, uh, such as LGBT people, are not heard and our voices aren't uh, listened to. And then you can get into a thing about it's an us and a them. And that it, we did have that experience and we continue to have a bit of a challenge in that regard in the city. Um, uh, now, having said all that, it has had been it has been progressive. It has certainly put Dublin City, city Council as an LGBT inclusive employer on the map. It's doing so uh, very well, as you know, with Selena Bonny, Bonny and Co in South Dublin. But we've also been contacted from uh, Claire. We've had contact just there lately. Uh, and this is to me, I would put my hats off, take my hats off to Clare, Clare County Council have contacted. That's very good. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and they've con they have contacted us directly. That means they get it. They know that the people that you should be speaking to and that who should represent you are you, not anybody else. So if you have people within your community who are willing to be open and out for you and speak for you and be present for you, they're the people you go to. Um, so it's getting that balance right within within a particular culture or within a within a particular organisation and given how they work and how we work and all that. So in terms of being whether we're a, a level of an LGBT inclusive employer at stage one or stage five, I think we're somewhere in the middle and yeah. we are making progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, you know, um, uh, and we're still seen as kind of rebellious in that regard that we're you know it's a bit it's a bit of, we're a bit of a challenge to sort of the status quo and it's our difference that's the challenge mainly i think um 
So, uh, so which is an interesting one, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I have to admit, I'm a bit surprised, and I'd only call it slow progress. I won't be more critical than that. A slow yeah. progress in Dunleary, North Town, and Fingal, yeah. because these are, I, I, I would have said, these are councils that I would have expected to have very similar ethos to yourselves in South Dublin, but yet uh, I appreciate it has to be from, uh, from the ground up. But I was just surprised does, because thank God this year had a winter pride. Very good, you know. They're, yeah, um, they did. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, and especially with Fingal anyway, although Dunleary did have a gay, uh, did have a rainbow flag during Pride in June last year mm -hmm. uh, and obviously with Covid they weren't going to do anything maybe, but they are on their coming out, to use that expression, they're mm -hmm. coming out uh, and being somewhat more progressive of late, but as you say it has to be from the ground up uh, and uh, Fingal, so Fingal and South Dublin are there, they're in touch with Dublin Pride and they're doing stuff for Pride and they'll do, so they'll do something this year and we will probably try to contact them contacted them from next month on to try and get something up and running, I think, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, well, let's get uh, on to the issue we wanted to discuss today with you, and that's uh, Dr. Patrick McDonough's book, Gay and Lesbian Activism uh, in the Republic of Ireland, 1973 to 1993. Now, it's a few weeks back since we, uh, dis we uh, spoke to Patrick himself. It largely consists of uh, his his PhD thesis. What yeah. was your initial impression? Yeah, you've read the book. I appreciate. So, what was your initial impression when you uh, when you completed it? Um, well, I mean, I would ha I admire the man for for yeah. for complete. This is a very erudite study, obviously, and it's something. It's, that it's a very academic it's study. A, it's an academic. It is. Yeah, it's an academic study. Uh, so uh, it, it's like very often with an academic study that sort of warmth won't be there however it's a it's a good study to have and he's gone back to where it kind of the gay rights movement actually started in Ireland which was in in the 70s by a few brave souls quite frankly um, uh, and brought us right up to the de de to decriminalization of homosexuality and there was a few things I was struck by uh, straight away the brave those people back in the 70s I mean oh, yeah. Being gay, lesbian, bi, or trans, particularly, just was taboo. And yeah. people grew up, well, A, were completely invisible. I mean, there was nothing growing up when I grew up. Uh, I'm, I was born in the mid 60s, so growing up, 60s and 70s, and, and into the 80s, where you were terrified. And Ireland was a very uh, hostile place for LGBT people in the 80s. And as you know yourself, Nick, a lot of people emigrated who were LGBT Absolutely. in the 80s yeah. because it just was not a nice place to be. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you wanted to be out and to live your life openly and to be as yourself, that just was. But so there was these very brave people, uh, and some of which I'd even forgotten myself. So I, I was kind of delighted to see it mentioned and delighted mm -hmm. to see the hard work they did. He definitely captured that because that was like, where do you start? If you think you're the only gay on this planet, where do you start to make connections and where do you start to talk to people? And where do you where do you meet people? So um, so going back to the to people like David Norris and uh, Terry Blanche and all those people that he mentions early on in the gay rights movement and the effort. I mean, that is colossal effort, human effort to do what they did, where it grew from the Irish gay rights movement into the various gay collectives to the NGF, the National Gay Federation, and how they made their contacts outside of Ireland and outside of North, uh, including Northern Ireland, which I kind of, I, I mean, I wasn't even aware of it at the time, that the Irish, that the Northern Irish gay rights movement was very helpful to, to hear, and um, particularly so around AIDS, raising AIDS awareness and the combat against AIDS uh, in our, like it was, it's a phenomenal, Mm -hmm. research. It's excellent research. Mm -hmm. um, Can I put something uh, to you then? I mean, I know from talking to uh, different people that there was there wasn't unanimity in terms of strategy. Now, David Norris uh, favoured the strategy of going the legal route, whereas others wanted to go the political route. Now, Patrick's book yeah. does a very good uh, job at showing how these ultimately coalesced. But um, what's your thoughts on that one? Do you think that David Norris's re uh, uh, view on that one, it did prevail, but do you think it was the correct one that um, that we might not have had the same 
uh, expedited progress had people have just been out there agitating and having marches and black uh, cards and all of that uh, because he very much brought it to the fore that the law was changed and the law in, in effect changed the culture as well. Yeah, I think there's I think it's a, there's a few things. Um, I think you're right. I think Patrick McDonough's book brings all that together and how they coalesced eventually brought it together very well. Um, and I can see place for all of them. I can certainly see, David, if you want to make real change where you have protection and rights in for people, everyday people in your everyday life, mm -hmm. then you go down the legal route. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, it, we need it. We need those laws to protect yeah. us. That's the way of our society. <clears throat> um, however, I also think what was there helping it were the agitators and the people who are doing uh, <coughs> definite work. I'm thinking particularly in relation to just human contact, so the people who had the telefriend, mm -hmm. the, the lesbian line eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the Gork Cake Collective who, who had um, allied themselves with other groups, uh, the, the women's rights movement and how people became attached and associated with them and made contact uh, with them and that they then were becoming allies before the term was even probably coined. And as well as that, then you had um, Mick, Quin Mick uh, Quinlan, uh, and others then who were working in, in terms of educating people in relation to AIDS and the big scare it was, and we all know the horror story that that was for gay men, particularly uh, in the 80s onwards, you know, so, but all, and that, uh, the AIDS Activists Alliance, I'm not even sure, I can't even quite remember the, their title, but they were the ones that were educating with practically no funding, uh, the health services. Uh, uh, schools everywhere. They were there actively doing that until they became exhausted themselves and worn out. Mm -hmm. So while David Norris was banging on and banging on and others uh, with support from others and right to bang on and bang on, we had that other stuff that was making an impact into people's lives uh, and making an impact uh, in, in a, from a double-edged sword kind of way where uh, governments then were being were, we had pressure put on them from these organisations to have a programme, to have a commitment to gay rights, a commitment to something, particularly after the European Court found in Norris's favour. There was pressure put on various governments uh, to bring bring in our agenda onto onto their uh, their manifestos. Yeah. Uh, and so on, and onto their program from government. Yeah. It worked from a number of angles, I think. Yeah. Can I ask you for your own recollections on this? Because what I said to Patrick is that uh, the, the picture he painted was very much white, middle class, and male. What's your recollection yeah. when you came to Dublin? I mean, uh, you, you, you may not have been out when you came to Dublin, I don't know, but. Uh, you certainly would have been intellectually uh, out. And I know that you were yeah. a very, very, uh, uh, dare I say it, even vocal activist for LGBTQ plus women. But um, were you a, um, uh, were you somebody that hung out in the Hirschfield Centre or did you, um, um, uh, did, did you come of age, as we say, with places like J.J. Smith's? Because that was one of the things I suggested to him is that, uh, he tended to overlook the female meeting places and the female meeting energy that was there that I've heard from talking to you. Yeah, well, that yeah, that is that is interesting. Actually, I'm from I'm actually from Dublin originally. Uh, I, I brought uh, up uh, yeah, and I brought up in a in, in a Catholic household, no more than any most people in the south were. Uh, and so I went to a Catholic school, uh, so I didn't grow up with a particularly good image of what it was to be yeah. LGBT, I certainly didn't grow up, it was, so I had a negative image okay. in my head, and at the same time, I ha never felt that there was something wrong with me for being gay. Mm -hmm. I did go through the thing of thinking, oh God, I'm the only one on the planet and this is awful and I'm going to be miserably lonely forever and ever and ever. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember one time I went to school uh, in the city centre, as it happens, I went to Loretta College and I remember yeah. one day uh, on the way home after school, I was standing at a bus stop. I usually used to walk home to Glass yeah. 11, but I, yeah. uh, but I was... Uh, was that Loretta yeah. in the green? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was standing, I, I was at a bus stop waiting to go home and a woman at the bus stop ahead of me. So this would have been sort of maybe 1980-ish kind of time. 
when I was about 15, 14 or 15, and, there was, and I had my school bag on, and so I had my school uniform, so I would have been recognisable as to what school I was coming from. Okay. Uh, and and uh, an older than me, but obviously a younger woman had a, a kind of a bag over her shoulder and a badge stuck on it saying, lesbian line, ring, such a thing. And I was I remember at the time saying to myself, will I actually talk to her? But I was so self-conscious in my uniform, yeah. I missed an opportunity there. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, it was so at the time when I was in my teens, uh, I was finding it very, very difficult to come out. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very difficult at the time. But you're talking about 1980, 1981. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I didn't really know where I should go. Do you know, do you know because Absolutely, you didn't see yeah. it. Uh, yeah, sure, you didn't yeah. see it in, in the media and you didn't see it anywhere. And I remember seeing Joni Crone on the Late Late Show. So that was in around 1980 as well. Yeah. Uh, and I remember being absolutely delighted because yeah. <laughs> I was sitting there watching the Late Late Show with my mum on one side of, of the sofa, my father in, in his armchair watching it. <laughs> And I could feel my face burning, but I was absolutely thrilled. And the three of us watching it together never commented one word about yeah. the Joni Crone interview. So yeah. that was the kind of atmosphere you were living in. That's what your formative years were made up of. And I remember thinking, but I didn't think about it until afterwards, how brave Joni Crone was yeah. uh, to do that. And I know that she had a bad time afterwards. Now, she did get good media. Uh, I know from the Late Late Show following that when Gay Byrne was reading out his letters that he received following her on, some were negative, some weren't. And uh, But it starts thinking, OK, so there's more like me around here. Mm -hmm. And to come back to your question, I mean, he does, he does actually, without maybe saying it so much, he does talk when we're talking about Lil, um, liberation for Irish lesbians and wanting a women's only space and coming together with the National Gay Federation or whatever it was at the time and having a space for a women's only disco in the Hirschfield Centre uh, was very difficult because once women were going to these places it was and women were very kind of their place was in the home even yeah. in the 80s in yeah. Ireland, their, the marriage bar was only lifted in the 70s so you were very much in the home and if you were going to go into these places uh, and bear in mind it was only in Dublin. You were going to go into these places and nearly sort of putting a badge on you saying, I'm a great big gay, I'm a great big lesbian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it would have been very daunting for women to do that. Uh, and notwithstanding, most people who weren't LGBT probably wouldn't have known what the Hirschfield Centre was for, you know, yeah. 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 or wouldn't have consciously known. So that fear that was there, I certainly lived with that fear in the early 80s. So it took me a while. It wasn't until it went to JJ's. Uh, when I went to JJ's, so I kind of missed the wonderfulness of the Hirschfield Centre and it wasn't until the Women's Nights went to JJ's that I started to go there and I think I probably made a come, come across that by accident <laughs> you yeah. know, one day. Yeah, yeah. you know. Can, can I ask you then again, and this is a, for your experience, at, at the moment I'm engaged on a project and it's to tell the personal stories of um, working class lesbian women many of whom perhaps would have had children, certainly would have been married. Do you think the experience for working class women was different? I mean, you having gone to uh, Loretto in the Green, you obviously yeah. middle class, and I'm not going to be yeah. derogatory about yeah, that. Yeah. Do you yeah, think no. the experience was different for working class women, just as it probably was for working class men? Yes, I do. I think the people who have, and but that's, it's reflecting society, the people who speak for people, or the vo spokespeople are middle class, generally, what, well, in our Irish society, middle class, white, educated males, mainly. Mm -hmm. So getting, reaching out, and that's why I'm talking about earlier on, then when I mentioned reaching out and, and going into our communities at a much more deeper level to discover the challenges that we did or didn't have. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say, and uh, a lack of, see, because certainly in terms of me being middle class, as you point out, that middle class, the church were very much in control of the schools. Very uh, much. Large, yeah, still so large very much. So, yeah. yeah, they start, yeah. Um, so the, the middle class education that I got was from a Catholic, was a Catholic Christian uh, mm -hmm. middle class education. And it was anything but positive in relation to being LGBT. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't even positive in relation to women. Yeah. So, um, 
And at the same time, you need to create that space, which probably wasn't created and certainly probably still isn't created for a more working class uh, um, engagement or working class involvement is to what. Uh, and it's, it was the likes because I did go on um, a good bit, a good while after I left school and work in Pavy Point. So I was working with, in the NGO sector and in the community sure. sector uh, for a while before I went to, before I joined Dublin City Council. So I would have had an engagement where there was low take up on uh, higher, higher education. Uh, and in those communities uh, mm -hmm. and the lack of um, education so what I'm trying to say is that certainly the secondary school education if it was to come to sex teaching on sexuality or sexual mores was always very negative I think the lack of education in relation to what people were able to gain access to education from working class probably would have had a very negative impact on how they perceived difference as well difference sure, in relation yeah. to sexual yeah. orientation I have yeah. to say um I, I can recall that I uh, going to Pride, and I think it was about 2007, 2008. It was before Pride had become uh, the big event the big that it is now, the march, yeah. And I remember yeah. going on the march from Parnell Square, and I think that was when it used to go to uh, uh, Wood Key, uh, the civic yeah. offices down there. But what That's really nice. impressed me at the time was the number of working class females that were on it. Um, it was extraordinary. Now, they may have all been grouped together. And that was when I realized, yes, this is a movement that has energy. This is a movement that has legs. And this is a movement that is going forward. Um, and uh, as I say, it, it may have just ended up being a side issue if those uh, if those groups hadn't have come together. Was that something that I know from uh, your time at JJ's that that was a space where people could come together? Is that your recollections of JJ's? Well, actually, some of my friends from quite a while ago, and particularly when I, I think I said it before, Mick, that when I, I had lived in, in Galway for a while and I came back to Dublin, yeah. uh, and then I was working in, in I was working with travellers and in the NGO sector, and I was finding that where am I going to meet nice women and all that, and I, I joined Swim and Women, uh, and then there's JJ's and there's that kind of stuff, and I was involved with Pride and to a very lesser extent lot. But it is amazing. See, that's the beauty of the LGBT wider family or the wider community. Yeah. Every one of us are from, We every one of us have a different background. Uh, whether we're, I know what you're talking about, the predominance of white, middle class, male yeah. spokespeople. Yeah. However, um, we, we, we traverse everywhere. We're everywhere, basically. Yeah. You know, that slogan yeah. from the 70s and the 80s, the gays are everywhere. Yeah. And we're in every community and we're in, whether it's rural, whether you're black, from whatever country or background you are, we're there. And that, and that is always about the LGBT family, wider family, is that we're made up of a multitude of cultures and we have a very diverse uh, community. And to tap into that, and we need, we need to keep challenging our own perception, perceptions of difference. So certainly that energy that you're talking about, work class energy, that feisty thing. Yeah. Uh, sometimes people have that feisty thing if they think they've less to lose. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I don't sure. mean that in the derogatory way, yeah. but I got to, I mean, I'm, I've put it to you myself in, just in relation to my workplace. Um, in some ways, I damage my own prospects of promotion by yeah. being a very vocal out LGBT person in work. And I'm now at the stage where it no longer bothers me that promotion yeah. <laughs> is out. And so I'm just going, I have less to lose. So I'm just going to say it anyway. So yeah. that, so that's about that these things aren't the end of the world if they if you don't get that promotion who cares i still have my integrity as a lesbian and as a woman and as to what it is and isn't okay yeah. and i would like to bring that to and i would like to see working yeah but like to answer your question yes that that energy and vitality is there for uh from and they were certainly very much involved all time and certainly they were involved in my what broadening my perspective of what it means to be an lgbt person you know and my friends even from the time of the swim and women in the 90s the mid 90s uh like well i think we'd all consider ourselves more or less left wing or certainly center left anyway you know yeah so yeah, just, I just want to conclude on this point because I want to give a shout out. I mean, one of the things that I did like about Patrick's book is, is that um, he, he mentioned people who I think are incredibly important, for, particularly from the female perspective, people like Joni Crone, um, people like um, Mary, um, uh, what's her name? 
Yeah, Mary. I I can't think of Mary. I can't Apart think of the, the, Wall, the, the, Yeah, no. Uh, uh, Wall, even people like, like now, McCaffrey and things like that. Who were the important people um, that were that, that you recall from that time and who really were trailblazers? The trailblazers. Oh wow! There's a few of them. There were, and there were people. Uh, and I have to say, you have to give a shout out actually to people like Cork. But uh, Mary Dorsey is Mary Dorsey. There. That's who we Mary were Dorsey. Yeah, Mary sorry, Dorsey, I, yes, sorry. Mary yeah. Dorsey. Uh, yeah. Terry Blanche. Uh, in terms of women now, Mary Dorsey, yeah. Terry Blanche, Grania Healy. Even though she was kind of yeah, on the back, she was yeah. there. She yeah. was there with the women's movement. Uh, Orla Egan in Cork. Yeah. Um, Anula Ward in Galway. Uh, and there was another woman there in Galway, I think, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to forget her name now, but yeah. she was in very much in the background and she did yeah. stuff, uh, I think, from her sitting room or something. You know, these are these are fantastic people as far as I'm as far as I'm oh, concerned. And we giant, also have giants, uh, giants, giants yeah. uh, serious, serious giants. Yeah. Alva Smith, of course, you couldn't, course, you yeah. can't. Yeah. You know, and as you say, Nell, but those feisty women there who yeah. wore their lesbianism on their sleeve, I think yeah. they're just great. And Joni has to be up there. Oh, and so, to me, jo fantastic. Joni yeah. is the Reverend Mother, really, isn't she? Even though she's oh, she really is. Yeah, yeah no, but... she seriously is. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the other thing, though, and um, um, the other thing there, just to say, he did refer to Edmund Lynch's interviews yeah. that he did yeah. with people. And uh, and I was delighted to see quotes from one of these people. These kind of things. He was talking about the Cork weekend, and he quoted uh, Mary yeah. Flanagan uh, saying that she just appeared down. Uh, these things. She came from the yeah. west. I think it was from Galway or something. She was she was a teacher, yeah. and she somebody had mentioned to her about this Cork Women's Fun weekend, mm -hmm. and down she went. And I think she went every year after. <laughs> Yeah. She nearly dropped, you know, so they these places were of huge significance uh, to, to people and they widened our community for ourselves, you know, Absolutely. Um, and I, yeah, so the work that went into organizing all of this, as you say, Mick, to be honest, which I'm standing on the shoulders of giants and I know yeah. I am, yeah. you know, well, so yeah. I am really grateful to them. Yeah, well, we know that Patrick's book only went up to 1993, and I think from 1994 onwards, it's, uh, it, oh, there is such a wealth of material there. And I know and this is probably much more documented. There is a good, uh, maybe it's a, maybe it's a uh, documentary, maybe it's a, uh, a PhD thesis, but the sec yeah. what, what I would call the second phase it's a very rich phase of the culture, isn't it? Oh, it, it? is. Mm. Yeah, it totally is. Yeah, and it has um, the, all the work done from the 73 to 93 up brought us to that phase where we could yeah. come out, we could gave, question gave, more and more. Gave, a platform, gave it a visibility. And yeah, a it did, yeah. And a very, yeah, uh, yeah it, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And it yeah. is, as you say, wonderfully rich and creative. And yeah, yeah. Warm, and, but, and not only that, you and I, I think we could be proud of the legacy we've given the generation that will go into the third phase. So, uh, which oh, is, I hope so. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Well, but, Unfortunately, we've run out of time today, but it has been an absolute uh, treasure to talk to you. We look forward to catching up with you again. So in the meantime, take care and we'll see you at Pride. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Look forward to that. Thanks a million, yeah. Mick. Take okay. care. Bye. Take care. Friends of Dorothy, come out off the sidewalk and onto the street to the sound of those legendary So anti M, I'm anti establishment. They took my name and the clothes I own. They broke our hearts, but not our souls. When there's no place like home. Like home.